the science behind the virus. Our STEM cafes are brought to you by NIU STEAM and the Center for P20 Engagement at Northern Illinois University. I'm Dr. Judy Diamond, organizer of the STEM cafes for the past eight years and your host for this evening. STEM cafes are designed to connect the greater community to the latest research and hot topics where adults eat, drink, and chat with STEM experts. Tonight, you will need to provide your own favorite snacks, drinks, and carryouts. We usually hold our monthly STEM cafes and restaurants. Our hearts go out to our restaurant partners. We wish them the best during these times and look forward to getting back to those restaurants. In the meantime, a couple of our partner restaurants are offering specials for virtual STEM cafe participants. Fatty's Pub and Grill in DeKalb is offering a 10% discount to anyone who mentions they attended our virtual STEM cafe. The Open Range, Southwest Grill, and Sugar Grove, our partner for both adult and teen STEM cafes, is offering $5 off of any order if the person says that they attended our virtual STEM cafe. For those of you that have not attended our STEM cafes, our partner, uh, our format, excuse me, for this evening is as follows. Our speaker will talk for approximately an hour. During the talk and following the talk, you can send in your questions and comments. We know there are many experts in our audience. And so often, our attendees add to the discussion with their comments and insight. We will end at 8 p.m. This cafe will be recorded. It will be posted on NIU STEAM website in about a week as we need to make sure that we have closed captions so that it is accessible to all. Our next STEM Cafe will also be virtual. It is scheduled for May 13th at 6 o'clock. The topic is eating in the 21st century. Be sure to share this information with your friends and family as I often put flyers in Starbucks and Panera Bread and and other uh, local uh, bulletin boards. And so I'm counting on you to share that information. Tonight, NIU STEAM is happy to bring you our presenter, Assistant, Prevent, uh, Assistant Professor Pallavi Singh from the Department of Biological Sciences. She has been with NIU since 2013. Prior to NIU, Dr. Singh was a senior research associate at Michigan State University. As we have been hearing new information about the COVID-19, you may have wondered what the scientists are sharing with each other about the virus. Tonight, Dr. Singh will discuss the latest scientific research about the coronavirus, tell us how viruses are different from other infectious agents, what makes them so deadly and what we can learn from historical viral pandemics. Dr. Singh is a molecular microbiologist and has been working on identifying microbial factors related to foodborne infections. Dr. Singh, would you like to begin? All right. Um, good evening, everyone. I hope you can see my slides as well as hear me. Well, thank you, Judy, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I have been with NIU since 2018, and I'm uh, very happy to uh, talk to you guys today about uh, science behind um, the virus. Um, as Judy mentioned, that I'm a molecular microbiologist. That means I study uh, microbes um, and their genetic material. And um, um, in relation to specifically infectious diseases and foodborne pathogens. So actually, I would like to begin by acknowledging uh, the NIU Center for P20 Engagement and the STEM CAFE team. 
uh, specifically um, Judy Diamond, who you just heard, uh, Aileen Click, Elizabeth Shui, and uh, Rosarin, who have been amazing in setting up um, this entire cafe um, and bringing all this information to the community. So my goal today uh, with communicating uh, the facts is basically science communication and uh, bringing all the knowledge that I am able to um, understand and gather uh, so the community in general can make sound decision. There have been about 7,500 research papers that have been published since January of this year on COVID-19. And as much as I wanted to read all of them, um, uh, that's um, I wasn't able to. Um, the second thing I want to uh, point out is that um, this is a rapidly evolving situation. The information that I share with you today is true as of um, either yesterday afternoon or, or this morning. And so this may not, this might either change uh, or may not uh, stand true as we are getting more information and more research is being done. And finally, I want to point out that a lot of scientists uh, from interdisciplinary fields have, gone, have come together uh, during this pandemic and um, are coming up with all the information that we can utilize and um, fight and um, um, you know stay healthy and move on. And this includes virologists who study viruses, epidemiologists who look at uh, the disease trend, how they move around, immuno uh, uh, immunologists who are studying how um, uh, the immune system uh, is reacting to the virus and many, many more. So I want to begin with uh, talking about the advancement in microbial studies. The microbial uh, uh, or microbiology was uh, initiated in um, late 1600s when uh, Levin Hook uh, designed the first microscope um, and he started studying the microbes. And um, the scene uh, sort of changed a little bit in uh, 1970s when a sequencing technology was able to sequence uh, some of the genes uh, of these microbes. However, um, in, late two, uh, in early 2000s um, was a game changer when um, next generation sequencing was um, made available. And uh, this next generation sequencing allowed us to study uh, microbes that were difficult um, to culture in the lab. And so uh, we were unable to um, understand how they react, how they behaved in their um, indigenous communities. Uh, perhaps a more notable uh, study that initiated um, after uh, next generation sequencing was the Human Microbiome Project, which was initiated um, in 2007. The Human Microbiome Project um, uh, recruited a cohort of um, humans that did not uh, exhibit any disease symptoms. Uh, which included both male as well as females, um, and they were um, studied uh, for uh, various body parts for various inhabitants. And so what was found from these 300 individual uh, sample samples was that um, the microbiome was present in the mouth, the respiratory system, um, stomach, intestine, skin, uh, essentially our entire body. In addition, we were also able to find the most abundant, uh, abund abundantly present microbes in these sites. Uh, for example, Streptococcus was found to be most abundant in our nose area. Uh, what we also were able to identify was how many microbes were present at these sites. Even though studies are still um, uh, underway to understand um, the functional aspects of these microbes, uh, it was found that our gut or the intestines 
had the majority of microbes. So uh, these microbes um, actually have a tremendous role in our bodies. They actually carry information and functions that uh, the human body is unable, uh, does not carry. Perhaps the most important functions are that these microbes are able to help the host against uh, disease and resist the colonization of infectious agents. In addition, they also help us in breakdown of food compounds that our body is unable to um, do. And there are several other functions um, like development of immune system, cardiovascular system, etc., that these microbes play a role in. And so the microbiome helps in maintaining a state of homeostasis um, in the host body. How, even though the microbiome um, is uh, uh, based on different kinds of factors, uh, including the environment, the kind of diet we take, uh, in the, the host genetic uh, material, uh, the microbiome helps in maintaining the state of homeostasis. And as long as the state of homeostasis is maintained, um, it brings about a healthy state in the host. However, if there is a change or a perturbation in the state, it leads to uh, disease conditions like allergies, etc. Because our bodies um, are uh, filled with these microorganisms, humans have also been um, called as the superorganisms. And um, um, uh, these, we are called superorganisms also because our bodies have about 10 to 100 trillion bacterial cells, which is way more than our, um, which outnumber the human cells 10 to 1. And there are more microbial genes present in our body as compared to um, human genes. And so this creates a mini ecosystem where a communal group of human and microbial cells work together for mutual benefit. And so the microbes that comprise of the microbiome are um, uh, bacteria, eukaryotic, fung uh, eukaryotic microbes, including um, fungi, yeast, um, as well as viruses. So the viruses actually uh, make up the microbial community and they have their own name. And this is known as the virome. The pie chart here actually depicts the composition of virome from the first three years of um, uh, human life. So um, the intestinal virome of the uh, humans is depicted here. And as you can see, that it is quite diverse. It consists of um, viruses that, call, uh, that use uh, humans as host or animals as host as well as viruses that need plants as host, and bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria and use bacteria as host. Um, the picture here uh, is an electron microscope picture that shows a number of bacteriophages on the wall of an E. coli cell. So the viruses are actually not only present in human intestines, but they are also found in various other niches. Uh, for example, they are also found in the ocean. So the ocean covers about 70% of the Earth's surface. Uh, they are important for climate control, as well as um, uh, they, are, they produce about 50% of the Earth's oxygen. So microorganisms are actually the major driving force behind the nutrition, nutrient, and energy cycles in, in the oceans. And viruses are the most abundant of these microbes. So as you can see on the left-hand side, the blue um, area um, represents viruses, which comprises about 94%. Even though the viruses are most abundant such that they can cover almost near uh, 60 galaxies. Since they are very small, 
the biomass that these viruses uh, comprise of is only about 5%. So moving on from uh, the idea that, uh, that we have established that viruses are omnipresent, we want to uh, talk about pathogens. So what are pathogens? A pathogen is basically an organism that is capable of causing disease in a host. And there are a variety of pathogens that are known to cause infections. There are uh, pathogenic bacteria, like Staphylococcus aureus, Chlamydia, tuberculosis, uh, pathogenic fungi that can cause athlete's foot, um, pathogenic protozoa, perhaps the important one that, or the famous one, is the one that causes malaria, uh, parasitic worms um, that comprise of the different worms, and viruses. And there are a lot of uh, species of viruses that are able to cause variety of infections in the host or humans. So if we examine um, the characteristics of viruses, we know that they are actually very small. This figure here first shows a human red blood cell uh, in comparison to a, a, ba a bacterial cell, which is an E. coli. Um, so a bacterial cell is way smaller than a human cell, and if we blow this up, we see that uh, viruses are even smaller as compared to uh, bacteria. So in addition to being small, what else do they have? Um, uh, basically, the viruses are made up of genetic material, which is surrounded by a protective protein coat. And some viruses may also have a lipid uh, membrane surrounding the protein. Again, there are multitudes of pathogenic vi viruses that um, are found to cause infections in humans. Um, perhaps the most notorious one is HIV, uh, which is known to cause acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS and is responsible for almost 32 million deaths since its discovery in 1980. Um, Ebola outbreaks have also been recent, um, where uh, in 2014 it was uh, found to infect humans in West Africa. And we, have, we encounter um, um, human influenza uh, flu season almost every year, where it can typically uh, lead to infections of about 500,000 um, uh, annually in the U.S. alone. So what makes them so infectious? Well, for one, we have established that they are small, so they are able to uh, reproduce very quickly. They have a fantastic uh, reproduction rate. Um, they are acellular. What that means is that they have no cellular organelles, like we've seen that they only have genetic material and a protein coat. Um, their genetic material can either be a DNA or a RNA, and not both, but they can be either or. And they are able to mutate uh, very easily and quickly. And this mutation allows them to jump from one host to another host. So um, since the viruses are acellular, they have no organelles of their own, they are also um, non-living entities. They are unable to uh, reproduce on their own until they find a suitable host. Once they do find a suitable host, they attach themselves to the host cell and take over the host machinery to produce its own progeny. So the first step is actually the attachment to the suitable host. Uh, and this works like a lock and key mechanism. Once the virus is attached, uh, it enters the host cell via a process of endocytosis. Once the cell, once the viron is, uh, virus is inside the host cell, it uses the host machinery to replicate its own DNA as well as make other components 
uh, other protein components that are required for its progeny. Once all the components are ready, assembly takes place inside the host cell. And once the virons are ready, they are released from the host cell uh, and in majority of the cases leading to death of this uh, host. So we have seen that viruses are omnipresent. Um, they are infectious because of the various characteristics. Uh, they are non-living. They take up um, the host machinery and they leave the host cell dead. But are all viruses harmful? Well, the answer is no. They have a lot of beneficial role to play as well. So for one, we know that we, there are viruses that are able to uh, attack bacteria, the bacteriophages. So they are able to kill harmful bacteria, uh, some that might be um, uh, also persistent and able to form biofilm. And this way, they are also able to modulate the host immune system or our immune system by keeping these microorganisms under check uh, thereby reducing the heightened immune reaction that would have taken place if they were not there. We also know that uh, overuse and misuse of antibiotics has brought us to a state of uh, development of antibiotic resistance in bacteria the, um, and uh, introduction of superbugs on which these antibiotics no longer work or are difficult to work. So bacteriophage can be used as um, alternative therapy uh, for like phage therapy that can attack these superbugs. Um, we have also uh, discussed that um, the viruses are present in the environment, especially the oceans, where they are responsible for breakdown of um, breakdown and recycling of biomass, which makes it available to other um, growing microbes as well as organisms. There are also studies that have shown that the viruses that infect plants may be actually helpful. So in this, uh, in a study that was conducted, um, uh, showed that the viruses may help in uh, improving the stress tolerant of plants under drought conditions. So on the picture that I show here, uh, on the left hand side, you can see a virus infected um, plant. So after 14 days of viral infection um, and drought stress condition, the plant infected with virus was able to perform better as compared to the non-infected one. And this is because it is, um, so it's been suggested that the viruses are somehow able to uh, improve the osmoprotectants and ox uh, antioxidants in the plant that leads to its survival. And I think this most fascinating one is uh, the tulip breaking virus that brings about the striped uh, feature in tulips, which makes it very beautiful. Uh, however, initially it was not known that this is a viral infection that causes tulip stripes, and so it was actually uh, pretty expensive. However, now we do know that it is a viral uh, virus that is causing this. So viruses can also be helpful. So how many types of viruses are there? So as we, um, um, as I just mentioned, that um, viruses can have um, either DNA or RNA as their genetic material. So a lot of families of viruses are uh, classified based on the kind of genetic material they have. Um, viruses can have on double-stranded or single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA is positive and negative. So uh, coronavirus actually fa uh, falls under the single-strand positive uh, viral family. The coronavirus family um, has four other subfamilies within it known as the alpha, beta, gamma, and delta coronavirus. The gamma and delta coronavirus at the bottom are uh, not known to cause um, human infections. However, 
the alpha and beta coronaviruses are the ones that are that have the ability to cause human infections and somehow their changes um, in their uh, um, viral structure or viral genome has allowed them to jump from host reservoirs into humans. So, um, uh, the coronavirus structure was actually first uh, identified by June Almeida. Um, she saw that um, there were uh, different kind of influenza virus like structure from nasal washings of a subject. Uh, she presented her paper um, um, when she found this, however, her paper was rejected by reviewers saying that these are some uh, poor images of influenza viral particles. But now, 13 years after her death in 2007, she is being recognized throughout the world for um, discovering um, and identifying coronavirus. So if we um, look at the coronavirus structure, it has uh, these crown-like structure or spike proteins or in its uh, surface, which gives it which gives it the name corona or crown. Uh, these spike proteins on the surface of the uh, virus allows it to bind to its host. Uh, we know that uh, the, the genome of the uh, coronavirus uh, is a single-stranded uh, RNA. And it also has a lipid membrane which has several other proteins with various functions. If we look at the genetic makeup of the beta coronavirus to which the corona, uh, the uh, most of the hu human infections belong to, um, the study of these genomes of the viruses um, puts them um, in close relation. And this can be studied by phylogenetic relationship. And this is actually a phylogenetic tree built on uh, the genome of these viruses. Um, so um, about seven different uh, human uh, coronaviruses have been um, highlighted on this tree. The five most um, um, uh, viruses that are able to cause, the five viruses that are able to cause human infections um, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, or commonly known as SARS, um, are on the top cluster here. And you can see that the next um, um, branch has a bat virus. So that uh, led uh, to the understanding that the SARS viruses are closely related to a bat virus and that bat might be the initial host of this virus. So the more closely related a cluster is to another cluster shows that they are, uh, their genomes might be more similar. So the first SARS outbreak was uh, caused by SARS-CoV-1 back in 2002, which first appeared in China. After triggering outbreak in China, it spread to, to uh, 26 countries, infecting about 8,000 people there and causing seven, almost um, 800 deaths, which was a mortality rate of 10%. It was pretty high. However, a second coronavirus uh, outbreak took place uh, about a decade later, which was known as the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, or MERS. And this was uh, even deadlier, which had about 35.6% uh, uh, mortality rate. The SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, uh, which is responsible for the current outbreak, belongs to the SARS coronavirus family um, and um, uh, has been shown to have about 2.3% mortality. The uh, 
dynamic tracking of um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 since its um, uh, identification has uh, allowed us to study how the virus is um, moving around uh, the world and how its genome is changing. So at the bottom here, the purple dots represent the viral genome from China. And the red dots represent the genome sequences of viruses isolated from um, America, so, uh, USA as well as Canada. Uh, this uh, amazing work is being done by the next train uh, team along with Global Initiative for Influenza Virus and John Hopkins University. Um, what we can see here is that the viruses shown here in red are have changed and evolved from the initial viruses that were discovered in uh, China. Um, so that means there are multiple strains of virus of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, um, revolving or uh, moving around in the population. However, what we see is that the uh, virus genome evolution is about at 26 uh, per year, which means about only two mutations per month are taking place for divergence of this virus. And so considering the large RNA genome that this virus has, it is a slow evolving virus. So evolution, um, could mean that the, uh, studying evolution also provides us uh, understanding of epidemiology because we can track how the virus is moving from one point to another point. And uh, this genetic variation is associated with geographic locations. This is also known as the founder effect, which um, basically means that random mutations um, are associated with uh, random uh, with different geographical locations. Um, SARS-CoV-2 has been studied for its um, um, viability on different surfaces. It has been established that the virus can travel um, via aerosols. And so this study conducted um, to see how long the virus is viable um, and uh, on different mediums. The first uh, um, plot shows here the virus in aerosols. And what we can see here is that the virus is viable up to three hours um, in air. Um, they also applied viruses on different mediums. And what they found was that SARS-CoV-2, uh, the orange, um, dot here is only able to survive uh, less than four hours on copper. However, on other materials, it is able to survive longer, specifically uh, plastic, steel, and cardboard. So what we know as of now is that SARS-CoV-2 virus um, is responsible for coronavirus disease or COVID. Um, and it has a large RNA genome. It has spike proteins that somehow changed and allowed it to jump from its primary host to human host. At this point, it is unclear how the virus jumped from its primary reservoir to human host. Could be via direct or indirect uh, intermediary host. Um, once inside a human, human-to-human -human transmission has been observed, which has caused the current pandemic. It is actually notable to see that uh, the virus uh, not only spreads from uh, infected patients to um, other hosts, uh, it has also been reported that this virus can spread through people who are asymptomatic. And this is very important because uh, in previous outbreak or SARS, first SARS outbreak, um, the virus only spread through infected people. And so it was easy to quarantine them and control the infection. However, uh, what we have seen uh, 
and COVID-19 is that asymptomatic people are able to transfer the virus. So this is a case study that was done in Wuhan, China. Um, the patient one here um, is, an, uh, is presumed to be the asymptomatic spreader. So uh, this patient one traveled with five other relatives to another city in uh, China. Uh, once they returned, um, patient six uh, started developing symptoms about a week later. And another week later, the remaining family members or relatives started developing symptoms. Um, since this patient had traveled with them, this patient was quarantined and observed for symptoms. However, they never developed a symptom. In fact, their first test that was done uh, to, uh, to detect presence of virus was negative. Uh, it was only a few days later that the patient one started showing symptoms. So what this means is that patient one was the probable uh, uh, carrier of the virus but never had any symptoms. Similarly, other studies from Boston and a skilled nursing facility has shown that about 50% of the population um, which is found to be positive with SARS-CoV-2 uh, is asymptomatic. And this is very important for us to know because this is why this virus is so difficult to contain. Um, and um, this also affects the transmission rate of the virus. So what is the transmission rate, um, which is also the reproduction number? So the reproduction number is actually how many people get infected uh, from one infected person. So um, what we can see here is that um, one um, uh, COVID-19, one infected person can infect about uh, anywhere from one to uh, five uninfected people, causing them to uh, get the disease. However, latest research has also showed that this number might be le uh, might be way more than 4.5, uh, up upwards of 6, because a lot of cases are still being um, reported. And um, this actually causes a major issue that shows that the virus is highly transmissible. Um, so um, as long as the reproduction number uh, transfer rate is uh, 1 and above, the virus will be transmitted and the pandemic will continue. To slow this epidemic down, the reproduction rate should be less than 1. There may, that means that the infected, infected uh, patient stops transferring to uninfected patients. So uh, latest stats on COVID-19 cases include, uh, this is true of uh, uh, yesterday afternoon. So uh, across uh, the world from 185 uh, countries, about 3 million cases have been confirmed. And US alone uh, has 1 million cases that have been confirmed in US. Uh, symptoms of COVID-19 include a fever, cough, dry cough, and shortness of breath. Uh, in some uh, cases, uh, diarrhea has also been reported. However, six new symptoms have been recently added by the CDC yesterday that include chills, uh, muscle ache, headache, sore throat, and loss of taste or smell. So how does the virus infect and cause the COVID-19 disease? So as we have heard that the virus enters through nasal passage and then goes down through the uh, lower airway into the lungs. So in the nasal passage as well as the lungs, uh, the virus is able to bind to uh, ACE2 which ACE2 receptor, which is angiotensin converting enzyme receptor, with the help of the spikes on its envelope. Again, these spikes um, binding to the receptor is like a lock and key mechanism where the where it is where it specifically binds to this receptor. 
Once this binding has taken place, the virus uh, is endocytosed, as we saw in the replication uh, cycle of the virus. And once it is in this um, endosome, um, acidic conditions allow the fusing of the viral membrane with the endosome membrane, uh, leading to release of the genetic material of the virus. There is another mechanism by which uh, the virus can enter the host cell. And this is with the help of a membrane protein known as uh, TEMPERS2 or transmembrane serine protease 2. Upon binding of the virus with the ACE2 receptor, TEMPERS2 cleaves the spike protein that allows the viral membrane to um, uh, fuse with the host cell membrane. And this fusion then allows uh, release of the viral uh, genetic material into the host cell. And the cycle, as we saw previously, uh, takes place where the host cell is hijacked and the viru virus produce, produces its proteins um, and nucle uh, nucleic acid and generates its progeny. So the figure here actually shows a release of multiple virions from a host cell. Um, so what happens in um, COVID-19 once the virus has attached to the cell and enters the host cell? So uh, before I talk about that, um, I want to point out the small uh, sac-like structure called alveoli um, in the lungs. These are the far, um, um, uh, these are the smallest uh, structures that allow exchange of gases in a healthy host system where normally oxygen gets transferred uh, between lungs and the bloodstream with the help of uh, capillaries. Uh, however, once a virus attaches uh, to the cell and enters, it causes infection. Um, what happens is that the immune system gets activated and releases chemical signals which, uh, which um, um, summon other uh, immune cells to come to the site to fight off the infection. So once this other once other immune cells come at the site, um, what happens is there is a stew of fluid and dead cells that is built up, which leads to a buildup of fluid in alveoli, and this corresponds to uh, pneumonia. Uh, Sim, um, uh, pneumonia like symptoms as well as uh, at this point um, coughing and fever shallow respiration as uh, also takes place um, at this stage simple um, oxygen support might help in recovery of the patient however in some cases this condition deteriorates very quickly and this is known as the acute respiratory distress syndrome or ARDS. At this point, the oxygen level plummets in the host cell and it makes it even more difficult to breathe. So in addition to uh, affecting the lungs, which is basically the ground zero of COVID-19 disease, um, multiple other organs have been found to be affected by this disease. On the left here, I am actually showing a figure that a picture that shows infected cells in blue, a dying cell which is releasing the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, in yellow color. And this virus was actually isolated from patient sample. So what are the other organs that are infected by this virus? Uh, brain has been shown to be affected with COVID-19, uh, 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 brain inf inflammation, meningitis, uh, strokes and seizures have been reported by doctors. 
Conjunctivitis and inflammation of the membrane of the eyes have also been reported. We have seen or heard that uh, patients lose their sense of smell and this might be due to damage of nerve endings in the, in the nose. Uh, we just saw that uh, how the virus infects the lungs which leads to uh, reduced oxygen intake. Um, heart and um, blood vessels have also been shown to be affected. A lot of uh, pay, uh, cases have been reported with uh, cardiac, cardiac arrest as well as uh, recent reports of blood clots have been also um, uh, uh, reported. Further, uh, liver is also shown to be struggling. Um, because of the virus, either is a, either because of an uh, increased immune system reaction or due to fighting off uh, the drugs that are being provided to the patients. Similarly, kidneys um, have been reported to be damaged, um, and low blood pressure has been associated with this. And uh, we, there are a few cases that report diarrheal infections due to associated with COVID-19. So um, people with, uh, who are older with underlying health conditions seem to be more at risk with this virus. It is striking that diabetes, uh, obesity, and hypertension have been linked um, to COVID-19. Um, um, COVID-19 um, has, has found to be uh, associated uh, with people or patients with, who also have obesity because obesity is linked to comorbidities like respiratory dysfunction which already takes a toll on the uh, lungs and the breathing. Uh, in addition, um, to other metabolic diseases like um, diabetes and insulin resistance, which can uh, lead to severe course of uh, COVID-19. So there are a lot of studies that are being done right now to uh, identify why um, these underlying conditions are, or certain populations are more susceptible to this, um, to COVID-19. So uh, one such study looked at uh, a human leukocyte antigen gene present in the humans. The basic function of HLA or human leukocyte is to identify an invading pathogen and report it to our immune system. So if um, the HLA is able to um, bind to the invading pathogen, they will be able to report it to the immune system and so it can be cleared out. However, if the binding is lower, um, then they, the immune system does not get activated. So a study um, uh, reported analyses of uh, HLA gene across various populations. Um, there are actually three HLA genes, HLA A, B and C. So specifically in HLA-B, what was found was that um, HLA-B uh, um, um, was able to um, bind and um, um, was, um, was, was, sorry, was not able to bind properly to the, uh, to the incoming pathogen. And these populations uh, were, more, um, uh, were not found in countries like India. However, as opposed to uh, another HLA gene, which was able to, um, um, which was not able to bind properly to the incoming pathogen, has been uh, linked to uh, countries like um, US, and maybe um, that can be uh, that can be responsible for the immune system uh, activation. So how do we move forward with this? Um, um, WHO, along with various other organizations, have um, um, set up a collaborative um, system called the ACT Accelerator, where uh, different foundations have come together to um, 
develop new vaccines and therapeutic systems. And so uh, before uh, we talk about the different uh, detection systems as th and therapeutics, um, we need to also test the, uh, we also need to test um, and increase our testing capabilities. So one testing, one such testing uh, capability is based on antibodies. And antibodies are basically proteins that are produced in our body upon infections, and they are known as immunoglobulins. There are five different classes of immunoglobulin, and IgM is one, so one class of immunoglobulin or antibody that first appears upon an infection, followed by IgG, which appears later. And so in antibody testing, blood sample is collected from a patient. Um, it is added to a sample well um, with buffers, and um, the test can be read in about 15 minutes. So if the patient has an antibody, um, um, either one or both the antibodies, we will see uh, uh, um, multiple lines which would show that the patient is positive. The second type of testing that is being done are molecular tests that rely on the genetic material. So to understand what how molecular tests works, I want um, depicting here a reaction, polymerase chain reaction or PCR, which basically allows us to increase the copies of uh, DNA or loan amount of DNA so we can study it. So Basically, multiple cycles of PCR reaction allow us to increase the copies of the genetic material. However, since um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA, an additional step is required, uh, which is known as reverse transcription. The reverse transcription uh, process converts the RNA into complementary DNA, and this DNA can now be further amplified for detection. And so for detection of SARS-CoV-2 via RT-PCR, uh, um, nasopharyngeal swabs are used. Uh, these swabs are then isolated for RNA and tested uh, via RTQ-PCR for presence or absence. What else is being done to move forward um, uh, about um, 997 clinical trials um, have been initiated all across the world to, study, to, to identify therapeutics as well as um, vaccine and other mechanisms to fight COVID-19. These potential therapies rely on the various mechanisms and steps that the virus goes through during its infection. Um, the, the first uh, clinical trial that has been uh, that is uh, ongoing or um, will be initiated is the con convalescent plasma uh, clinical trial. Convalescent plasma is basically whole blood or plasma from an infected patient who has recovered. That means that the the patient would have or now the recovered patient would have antibodies to fight off SARS-CoV-2. So once um, the antibodies from the recovered patient is um, um, transfused into a current uh, uh, infection, they may be able to fight off the infection and clear the, uh, clear the pathogen. Several other drugs like uh, chemostat um, is, is, being on, is being tested for its efficacy to stop TEMPERS-2. If, if you remember, TEMPERS-2 is one of the uh, proteins that allow binding of uh, the virus membrane, fusion of the bi virus membrane, and uh, begin initiation of uh, viral replication cycle. Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine have been found to reduce the acidity in, in, uh, in the endosome, which is important for the fusion of the viral membrane to the endosome and release of the viral, uh, replica, uh, the viral genetic material. Um, uh, other drugs have also been used uh, which uh, target the uh, protein, replica, uh, protein uh, production cycle of the virus. And remdesivir is another um, um, drug that is being trying, tried out for 
uh, inhibition of replication of uh, virus nucleic acid. Uh, further vaccine development trials are being going on. About 115 vaccines are being tried out uh, with almost seven under clinical trials. Uh, these uh, vaccine candidates are of various types, but the ultimate um, uh, the ultimate goal is that um, that those um, low, uh, low infectious um, material can elicit an immune response. So when an actual invasion takes place, the body is ready to fight it. Um, traditionally, virus uh, vaccine production can take upwards of 10 years because it's a long and expensive process. However, during a pandemic such as right now, we have to change the paradigm of uh, vaccine production and carry out multiple steps in parallel so that we can have an accelerated vaccine production. And even though um, this might be more expensive to produce multiple vaccine candidates in large scale until we know which one works better, it is definitely minuscule in comparison to the economic loss we are uh, undergoing due to uh, the lockdown. And so the idea is uh, to develop immunity in population. And the more people are immune uh, to this virus, the less it will spread. And this is known as the herd immunity, where more people uh, are able to develop immunity to curb the, uh, or contain the viral spread. This can be done by various ways. Uh, one is the testing, the various kinds of testing I just discussed, as well as um, initiating contact tracing. Contact tracing is basically um, uh, tracing back the steps of an infected patient, uh, infected patient once they have been tested positive, and uh, testing all the other people that this person would have come in contact with and decontaminating all the areas that this person would have uh, gone to. Uh, since we know that uh, asymptomatic spreading is important um, in COVID-19, uh, studies have shown that um, the um, community surveys can be done um, by testing a viral presence in sewage. So a study in Paris was able to relate the presence of virus to, um, to the outbreak, um, the ups and downs of the outbreak. So while uh, these um, treatments and um, are being um, designed and tested, what can we do? Well, so the best thing we can do is to stay at home and reduce the spread of the virus. Um, we should wash our hands uh, um, more because this allows the breakdown of the virus particle and forming of a missile that allows uh, washing away of the virus. Uh, in addition, uh, we have been all practicing social distancing, social distancing rule of uh, six feet um, um, has been um, recommended whenever uh, uh, possible though. However, uh, the six feet might not be, um, might not be um, mm, um, helpful in all the cases. For example, if the person sneezes, the aerosols uh, that uh, can travel up to 20 feet. In addition, um, if, the, if the people are moving or there's uh, air moving, um, the, 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 the aerosols can further travel uh, in distance. So we, uh, the guidance to wear a mask has been also passed recently to stop the spread and various homemade masks can be used. However, how we put them on and uh, is more important. It is important that we do not touch our face or the front of the mask while putting them on uh, or taking them off and washing our hands for about 20 seconds um, 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 before and after. 
Um, I had a small video here, but I'm going to skip that, which basically shows how the mask is able to uh, stop the spread of uh, the virus. And so basically we are doing all of this to um, flatten the curve. And what does flatten the curve mean? Um, and we may have heard of this multiple times. Flattening of the curve basically means uh, decreasing the burden on our healthcare system by spreading out the infection so that every person can every infected person can get a chance so this brings up uh, brings me to the last section what have we learned from historical pandemics and so we know that the largest uh, last lar uh, biggest breakout uh, outbreak was um, in 1918 um, with the influenza virus, also known as the Spanish flu, which lasted up to 1920. Um, during that time as well, there were a lot of guidances that were given um, to maintain uh, social distancing um, or quarantining and wearing masks in public. Um, however, uh, the social distancing measures um, uh, were uh, 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 managed to um, were somehow implemented differently in various uh, states and so this study actually looked at how the social distancing uh, affected the uh, out uh, the flu outbreak in 1918 so as you can see here that um, the first graph shows um, outbreak um, in uh, from St. Louis and St. Louis was actually one of the first uh, states to um, implement social distancing measures however when the cases started going down and the curve was flattened they lifted their social distancing which led to a second peak uh, in infections this was the case for Denver as well um, and uh, the New York City was one of the uh, uh, one of the cities that implemented the isolation and quarantining way ahead of the other cities, and even though um, uh, and the and the infections actually died out uh, pretty rapidly, and New York City was one of the cities that had the least um, uh, uh, mortality on the eastern um, seaboard. As opposed to um, New York City, Pittsburgh, on the other hand, um, uh, passed a public gather a gad ban on public gathering. However, it did not implement school closures. And when the school closures were implemented, public gathering uh, bans were lifted. And so that led to an increase in uh, uh, the cases in Pittsburgh. Um, in addition to that, uh, uh, Philadelphia was another city that uh, did not um, initiate uh, social distancing. In fact, after their first case was detected, they hosted a, a public gathering which about 200,000 people had attended. And at the end, um, Philadelphia had actually lost about 15,000 15,000 of its citizens. And so together these data in, uh, indicate that um, the time at which the social distancing measures are implemented and the way they are implemented may affect the outcomes of the, of the disease. And so uh, we need to follow the guidances that are being provided to us by various sources so we can uh, spread the uh, spread, uh, we can stop the spread of COVID-19. Uh, another thing I want to uh, point out is that a lot of um, um, information is being provided by uh, various sources. We should uh, try to uh, approach reliable sources, uh, National Institute of Health, CDC, WHO, IDPH, Illinois Department of Public Health are all updating uh, regularly the way we need to tackle and move forward. So please stay informed and uh, rely on information from reliable sources. And um, 
to end, I would like to say please stay home, save lives, and uh, thank all the workers that are helping us, um, uh, physicians, emergency people, um, to help, to a grocery store workers who are out there to help us so we can stay home. Um, and with that, I will take in. Hi, uh, this is Judy. Uh, I'm back. And uh, I think this is a, a good time for you to refresh that drink if you need to. And, uh, and as people are starting to think of questions and putting them in, we have a few in already. And so we'll give you a couple of minutes to, uh, to think of some questions. Uh, so we'll be back in about two minutes. Hopefully everybody can hear me. I know we have some experts out there, so feel free to uh, also provide comments and uh, some information that you might know. Right, we're getting some good questions here. We'll be just starting in uh, just a couple minutes. Okay, we will start at 7.10 uh, answering questions or asking questions or sharing out here, just so you know. Don't forget to say the date for STEM Fest, October 31st, and don't forget that our next STEM Cafe will be on May 13th at 6 p.m. eating in the 21st century. Don't forget to share the word. We also would love to have you uh, provide feedback uh, by sending me an email at jdymond at uh, niu.edu uh, because uh, it always helps us to improve. And also, if you have ideas for future cafes, you're always welcome to hear that. 
again, we aren't able to get out to those Starbucks and Panera Breads and uh, Jimmy John's and all the other great places that have bulletin boards, so share the word. And, uh, and just uh, the last thing before we start asking the questions, uh, don't forget that uh, Fatty's Pub and Grill is offering 10% discount to anybody who says uh, that they attended this virtual STEM cafe and orders. And also uh, in Sugar Grove, the Open Range Southwest Grill is giving $5 off for anybody who attended, attended this evening. And that will go on till May 15th. Okay, uh, are you ready? Uh, because if you are, I'm going to start. All right, here we go. Our first question. Based on the data scientists have uh, collected until now, when can we expect the coronavirus to reach its peak? Uh, so um, I think um, a lot of studies are still underway. Um, and different geographic locations are seeing um, peaks at different times. Um, the peaks have started uh, plateauing or somewhat in a downward trend in uh, countries like um, China and Italy. Um, and um, uh, even in the US states like New York City are seeing uh, so plateauing of the curve. So it actually uh, depends on where the infection reached and um, how it moves in that location. Thank you. Our next question. Is there a reason why norovirus and coronavirus and rhinoviruses are not part of the pathogenic virus slide or HPV, etc. Um, is this regarding my slide that I showed? Um, I was just showing examples, and there are many, many, many more viruses, pathogenic viruses. There wasn't. It was just a random pick of slide of pictures. Okay. Uh, did you need me to repeat that, or you got that? You can see the question, right? Okay, that's good. So I'm going on to the next one. Our next question, is there a possibility for an effective cure to be discovered anytime soon? Um, again, a lot of clinical trials are underway. Um, I discussed some of them that have uh, that are being uh, tested. Um, uh, antivirals therapeutics that are being tested right now. Um, um, the problem with these antivirals that are being tested, there is also that uh, one that they're being repurposed from uh, different infections like uh, uh, and antivirals uh, from HIV um, or uh, previous uh, SARS infection uh, is being repurposed. So um, their efficacy um, uh, even though they might be effective, how effective they are is not really known. And secondly, uh, these drugs um, or the, uh, the antivirals um, are, have a lot of side effects. Uh, specifically, we know that uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine has been reported to not work as effectively and, um, in fact, have side effects on the body uh, that might lead to cardiac um, uh, arrest and other uh, blood clotting um, um, in in the in the patients. So um, there are studies underway. We we don't have one yet. But thank you. Our next question: How are antibody studies results shared among the various bodies uh, doing the research? Um, um, I think um, 
uh, it depends on who's carrying out um, the uh, various tests. Um, this uh, at the state and the city level, um, uh, if the tests are being done, uh, they are reported to the government, um, um, like DeKalb County Health Department uh, uh, might be reporting to Illinois Department of Health, and that data is gathered there. Uh, WHO is collecting data from all the tests that are being done um, 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 and confirmed and shared along, and that is why we have all of the confirmed cases that we are able to um, have the tally for. And so I think it depends, but I think um, people are reporting Thank you. The next question, well, a comment. Uh, this was excellent. Thank you so much for this presentation. I agree with that. And our, our next comment, uh, some antibodies can provide immunity, easy to identify. Can they be grown in large numbers? Um. Well, yes, the antibodies can be grown, and one of the mechanisms that uh, is no is the monoclonal antibodies that basically are purified antibodies against specific antigen on the on an infectious pathogen, and this is being I think tested as well. Um, but I am not sure at what stage the test is currently. But yes, that can be done. Um, however, it is also expensive to uh, produce a lot of antibodies because it needs. A Thank you. Our next uh, comment. One previous study examined how long the virus remained viable on different sub, uh, sorry, substrates like copper and cardboard. Does viable mean that the virus is still infectious? able to cause disease to a person? Um, so um, this, um, uh, the study that uh, reported viability uh, tested um, uh, the virus titer, basically the quantity of virus that was able to survive on cell culture specifically, uh, they used um, monkey kidney cell lines, Vero cell lines, and so uh, what the virus was able to infect the host and replicate, and those titers were measured. So whether or not they're infectious in a in a live host, um, I, I don't think I. Uh, that is something I cannot talk about. But uh, of course, the virus was able to uh, grow and. Uh, the next one. In your opinion, does the curve of reported infections reflect the uh, rate of testing or the rate of transmission? Sorry, the curve of what? In your opinion, does the curve of reported infections reflect the rate of testing or the rate of transmission? Um. Um, if we are talking about uh, the, the flattening of the curve, that curve is actually uh, dependent on the cases that are reported and uh, the cases that the health system is dealing with. Okay, the next one. And okay. are, uh, are they easy to differentiate from antibodies that don't provide protection? Um, so uh, the um, the antibody test that is done is uh, specifically for antibodies uh, that are produced against uh, the uh, COVID-19 virus. And so um, if if the antibody test is positive, that means the person is immune or protected against uh, the virus. Um, and if if um, because we have antibodies uh, moving around through our bloodstream, there are a lot of these are basically proteins that are present in the body, but they will not react or will not be able to give a positive uh, reaction if they are not specific to the to the antigen or the pathogen that they are made for. So, um, 
in case of the COVID-19 antibody test, if it is positive, uh, it, does, it does mean that it is protective. Thank you. The next one. FDA reported today that a vaccine trial may be available as soon as September and a vaccine broad enough to support the population by 2021. You mentioned an accelerated vaccine force due to the pandemic. Do you feel it is realistic to expect a vaccine available for our population by 2021 flu season? Um, I, I don't think I'm very qualified to answer this question, but I know a lot of trials are underway. Um, a, a vaccine um, that was found to be efficacious uh, and by Oxford uh, researchers is already under uh, production in India because it is cheaper to produce uh, uh, large-scale production in uh, in that uh, in India, and so um, uh, there are there are trials that are going on as well as simultaneous production. So who knows? Maybe. Earlier, you mentioned that loss of taste and smell is a symptom of COVID-19. Why is that? So, um, um, I think uh, one of the reasons uh, that I've come across is that um, the virus is able to um, affect the nerve endings and the nose that is responsible for the sense of smell, and so because of that, um, um, the, the patient loses the ability um, because of that damage. Uh, next is a comment. Thank you, Dr. Singh, for the seminar. I found it very interesting. Thanks, Linda. <laughs> is there evidence for transmission to humans from cats? Um, in fact, um, Yes, uh, there is. There is a recent study that has come out that uh, looked at transmission of COVID-19 virus in uh, fields and cats, and they did find that cats were actually, um, even though low, were able to um, uh, have the virus transmitted. Um, and um, pre um, previously, um, a tiger in Bronx Zoo was uh, reported to be COVID-19 positive. Um, I think there was a cat somewhere in Kuro, uh, domestic cat somewhere, I'm forgetting the location, which was also found to be positive. So yes, uh, it seems like it can um, be transmitted to uh, uh, pets. And so I think I read somewhere that they're also trying to establish social distancing for pets because um, this can be transmitted. Yeah. yeah, I think I heard something about a dog yesterday. So, uh, I here's the next one. I may have missed this because I briefly lost my connection. There are many people who have recovered from the COVID-19 infection. Is there evidence that they have acquired immunity from reinfection? If not, does that that does not bode well for developing a vaccine? Um, so, um, it, since the disease is in its early stage, um, there is um, not enough information or time that has passed by to tell us whether um, the immunity is against a reinfection. Uh, I've um, read um, anecdotal reports of um, reinfections in people who have recovered, but there isn't a strong data. And um, in terms of uh, vaccine development, uh, so um, 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 I think uh, the idea behind developing vaccine is to um, develop a strong immune system, but at this point, uh, we don't know whether this vaccine will require a uh, 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 you know, a uh, booster dose or a seasonal uh, immunization as we need for flu vaccine. So uh, there are a lot of unknowns uh, currently. How long will a pan? Uh, excuse me. How long will a person be or stay asymptomatic? Um, 
well, a person, um, a, a person probably, uh, if they are asymptomatic, um, in, in the case study that I shared, they actually never developed any symptoms. So they can be just silently spreading the virus, but never have a symptom. But uh, again, we don't have a lot of data for that. Um, um, this asymptomatic people can actually be pre-symptomatic. That means that when uh, the tests were being done, they were positive for the virus, but they may um, require um, uh, or exhibit symptoms later on. So, uh, so it depends whether the person is characterized as asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. Um, and um, uh, so uh, the incubation period of the virus is about 14 days. So um, um, people have reported asymptomatic cases um, um, are exhibiting no symptoms up to 20, 24 days, which is, uh, which is pr pretty long. Do you have any insight into why the U.S. is having so much trouble doing widespread testing for the virus? Uh, I think um, uh, strong measures need to be taken to implement testing, um, and uh, uh, a lot of agencies are uh, stepping up to do that now. Um, I heard of uh, um, uh, organization um, uh, that is um, collectively trying to initiate um, this um, increased testing. Is there a history of antibodies being replicated and grown in large numbers? Are they keyed to blood type or universal? Um, so um, I, um, I think um, antibodies are developed for research purposes or uh, for extreme cases. Um, um, that uh, again, uh, like I mentioned, monoclonal antibodies are being um, looked at for uh, developing um, our, our disease resistance, uh, sorry, uh, clearing of the infection. Um, I don't know about uh, blood type um, that, that they have looked at or if, they, if it can be looked at. Uh, here is a comment. Thank you for the very informative and understandable presentation this evening. Thank you. Here's another one. After a person gets better from COVID-19, will the virus to some degree stay in the host? Um, um, I think that's a very good question. And... Um, the virus actually should be cleared out, um, but I don't know if there's any information about uh, viral shedding thereafter. So, um, to my understanding, it should be cleared out. Uh, do you feel that antibody testing will be accurate enough to a wide scale by fall of 2020, so children may be able to return to school in the fall of 2020? Um, I think any test um, that is um, carried out has um, either false positive or false negative. Um, so uh, whether a test is 100% accurate, um, that's a difficult call to make. However, um, multiple uh, testing via multiple types can um, allow us or multiple times can uh, help us understand whether um, a person has developed immunity or not. Um, and as for the timeline, I don't think uh, we know a lot, in, uh, we know that when things can get back to normal. So yeah, I'm sorry about that. I don't know. <laughs> what is the latest progress on the Oxford and Johnson & Johnson virus studies? Um, so I guess uh, this question is related to the vaccine uh, development, and as I just mentioned, um, the Oxford study has found uh, their vaccine to work, and so they are um, they have actually simultaneously um, 
um, started um, uh, production, large scale production as well. And I've also read uh, the Johnson study um, as also um, um, proving if, if effective, but I don't have an update on that. How long does the COVID-19 stay in the air and on surfaces? Uh, so COVID-19 virus is actually, um, um, as this one study showed, is able to stay up to three hours uh, in air. And if it remain viable, that means, again, um, viruses are non-living entities, but if they find a suitable host in time, they may be able to uh, start their uh, replication cycle. So about three hours is what we see, or at least the study has reported. And um, it depends on the type of surface the virus is on. So uh, it's found to be uh, associated with um, plastics and uh, cardboard for longer time. Thank you. Uh, vaccine studies. I don't know. They want to know anything that you know about vaccine studies, evidently. Uh, um, so I think I um, shared uh, uh, information on the various vaccines that, that are being uh, carried out. Uh, like I said, about 115 vaccine candidates are being looked at. Seven of them um, have uh, been um, already, are already in clinical trials. Uh, the Oxford study is also uh, seems uh, pretty, um, or at least they're reporting that uh, it's uh, effective. Do you have any background information about SARS, CoV-2, infections in domestic animals. How concerned should we be about our pets? Um, again, there is a study that looked at um, um, virus transmission in uh, pets and domestic animals. Um, um, I have not seen uh, or read about symptoms, so I don't know how it affects. What uh, my understanding is that it um, is not um, uh, an effective, um, uh, that the, pet, the, uh, the pets are not an effective host. So even though it is able to transfer, I don't know what kind of um, um, disease severity it might lead to. Thank you. How effective are the plasma transfusions and are those only best for the very sick? Um, so, uh, again, uh, uh, this clinical trial is still underway. We do not have a lot of information. I have read anecdotal um, uh, um, reports where um, the plasma transfusions uh, were used, um, and yes, they were used on extremely sick patients, and um, um, I saw that it was helpful in that case. Are you able to speculate on the amount of cases in the USA? I know that one million cases have been reported thus far in the USA. I saw one report that estimated for every reported case there are 75 unreported cases. Also, how many cases would we need in the United States to achieve herd immunity? Um, so um, I think uh, speculating uh, the number of cases um, um, is a little bit difficult. And there are multiple reasons for that. Um, because as, as we uh, uh, implement uh, various uh, recommendations and regulations, it changes uh, how people are behaving. So initial models were really grim uh, when um, U.S. had um, started um, uh, with increased infections rate. However, that did not happen, um, uh, which, uh, which actually meant that the steps that uh, people took were able to help um, 
and reducing what the uh, what what was more uh, estimated and speculated. So um, and if um, these numbers can change again, if um, depending on um, how the different states regulate um, their uh, um, social distancing rules, etc. Um, so herd immunity is the best way. However, herd immunity uh, by any other way except for vaccine vaccination or by immunization um, can be dangerous because it actually just means exposing oneself to the actual virus. So uh, that is not a very viable way. Uh, so at this point, um, um, achieving herd immunity um, is uh, waiting on a vaccine, um, which which might seem very long. Uh, but then um, a lot of therapeutics are also being tested, and uh, if we are able to identify one that works best, um, that might be helpful as well. However, testing is the way that we'll be able to identify the number of cases and how things are progressing. Okay, next one. How far behind New York do you feel the data shows for Illinois? Uh, how far behind in terms of uh, positive cases? Is that the question? I think so. I'll repeat it. How far behind New York do you feel uh, that we are in Illinois? What is the data showing us? So, how far behind uh, are we? Um, uh, I think we have um, about 2,300, uh, uh, yeah, two, about 2,000 um, deaths and uh, a little over about 15,000 cases. So we are uh, uh, we are very low in numbers as compared to New York. Uh, uh, I don't know if that means uh, what it means for the curve or if, we, I, uh, if we've reached the peak. I don't think we have so. Okay. Um, the next question: How closely related to the is this to MERS? Given that MERS is common in the Middle East, where heat and disease transmission is not a factor, what is the likelihood that this will be seasonal as opposed to year-round? So uh, uh, the MERS. Uh, is uh, related to Middle Eastern uh, the, uh, uh, countries uh, because it actually has camel as the reservoir. Um, uh, so somehow the MERS virus jumped from a bat to a camel and um, and camels are mostly found in the Middle Eastern region. So I don't know uh, if, if it is because of the temperature or other condition or it's just because of the host reservoir. Um, again, for COVID-19 virus, uh, we do not have uh, data and so um, uh, it is hard to tell um, uh, what kind of seasonal variation it might bring around. Um, however, there have been certain models, but the models, um, uh, again, are um, dependent on a lot of factors, so, yeah. What studies have shown uh, about the lasting immune protection, SP vaccines or SP infection recovery of coronavirus in general? Um, yeah, again, there aren't a lot of data to, um, to talk about immune protection uh, from the virus. And you evidently you have a friend out there named Josephine. She's uh, uh, hi, Josephine. Say She's hi. actually an assistant professor in the university as well. And so um, Josephine works on microbiome too. So hopefully we'll be collaborating. And I just announced it, so we should collaborate. Thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Very scientific, but also informative is uh, a comment we have. And I agree. Uh, here is an, uh, 
Another comment, any statistics about infection on children or teenagers? If so, what age range? Um, so uh, I don't know about the statistics, but yes, um, children and um, uh, teenagers have been shown to be infected. Um, this virus does not see age. Um, we have seen um, cases in younger children as well. Yeah. Uh, again, a comment, very interesting presentation. And, uh, and another comment, uh, very well done. And uh, another one, thanks for a great seminar. Thank you, Dr. Singh. Um, Thank and, you for all the lovely uh, comments. Uh, and here is a comment. Is there research on people who are more at risk for cytokine storm? I don't know that. So I would guess autoimmune disease would put you more at risk for that storm, you can see this question, can't you? Yeah. So, um, okay. so cytokine storm is basically the um, the release of the uh, chemical signaling uh, that takes place uh, as uh, um, as the viral infection is taking place, and um, um, that brings about all of these um, other um, uh, proteins like um, cytokines and um, in, uh, interferon and interleukins to the site and um, leads to an uh, hyperimmunity. Again, a lot of underlying conditions are being reported uh, um, as a result um, um, that and sp ones that are also associated with uh, um, autoimmune diseases uh, that um, have been reported. I, so we don't know or at least my understanding is that there isn't clear data with whether this is a causal effect or whether um, uh, whether it happens um, as the infection is proceeding or progressing. All right. If I am not mistaken, a person can get COVID-19 from a cat or other animal. Is If this is correct, would it be the same virus as a human to human, or would it be a mutation since it is from an animal? So the COVID-19 virus, um, um, we do not know what the intermediary host is. It has been shown um, that it likely emerged from a bat reservoir, but how it went from a bat to humans is not known. Uh, so we do not know if which kind of animal might play a role in it. We have there are some anecdotal reports of the virus being transferred from humans to other animals. Again, um, the virus will have to undergo mutation such that the spike protein is able to attach to some um, receptors on the host if it is jumping. So that's probably what happened when it jumped from bat. Uh, to uh, intermediary host or directly to humans, and so uh, that is something the virus will have to to, to find another host. But I I don't think I've, I I don't think there's data to show that uh, humans have gotten it from a specific animal. Right. Uh, this is uh, the person that uh, asked about comparing New York and. Uh, Illinois, and we're how far behind New York are we? And I think they were talking about the curve. You were asking, are you talking about the curve or not? And they said yes, that's what they were talking about. Yeah. So uh, again, I think um, um, we are we we have not reached our peak yet, and uh, but we are flattening the curve in Illinois, which is which is amazing. Right. Can you go a little bit into middle age strokes and why they are happening? Um, so, um, cardiac arrest and uh, blood clots are being reported um, as a, a symptom in severe cases. Um, um, I, again, I don't think we have a lot of data, but um, um, they could be because of multiple reasons. First, it could be a side effect of the uh, 
antiviral drugs they are on. Uh, it can also be due to um, changes in blood pressure. So the ACE2 receptor protein uh, is actually a receptor for a protein called, uh, which is responsible for maintaining blood pressure in the body. And so if um, the receptors are occupied or being taken away uh, from the, uh, by the virus, what might happen is that um, the, uh, the P, um, blood pressure regulating uh, protein is unable to uh, get activated. In addition, it might lead to increased uh, immune reaction as well. Um, so those could be some reasons for um, increased blood clots and strokes. And blood clots themselves can um, cause cardiac arrest. All right, and here is a comment. Thank you for your presentation. We learned a lot and appreciate you taking this time to put this together for us. Can't wait to hang out with you again. And this is uh, Kanjana family. Thank you, Kanjana oh, and here's, <laughs> And here's another question, uh, comment or question. Are there other coronavirus in, uh, coronaviruses and bats that could potentially infect humans in the future? So um, that's an amazing question, actually. Uh, bats are a reservoir of uh, over hundreds of species of uh, strains of coronaviruses. And there are researchers who are studying um, how these, uh, how or if these corona, other coronaviruses will get transmitted uh, to humans. In fact, uh, coronavirus 2, um, uh, that we are seeing now uh, was uh, deemed as a low potential to be transmitted from humans, sorry, from bats to humans, but it did uh, mutate and transfer. So there's still a potential uh, that a new um, virus can transmit. Yes, I don't think, uh, I think that that's a possibility and that a lot of scientists working on coronaviruses and other viruses are uh, dedicating their time to study this exact question. All right, here, uh, would taking a baby aspirin help with preventing my risk for stroke related to COVID-19? Um, so, um, um, the strokes that are um, taking place are taking place in um, uh, severe infections and severe cases. And um, again, um, they are uh, likely uh, to be due to blood clots and um, aspirins probably would help that. However, uh, again, it depends on um, the situation of the patient again and I am not a physician and I probably should not have said any of the words that I just said but um, uh, aspirin uh, may or may not help I, I have not seen data on that uh, again I'm not a physician um, physician may be able to answer that better thank you and here's another uh, positive comment thank you very much and then another question or comment one of the big clinical lab companies, I think Quest, has announced the availability of serum antibody uh, testing, but warns of the possibility of false. Um, let me see. Just a minute. I got to get something here. Something here. Something here. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Uh, let me start that over. One of the big clinical lab companies, I think Quest, has announced the availability of serum antibody testing, but warns of the possibility of false positives from cross-reactivity with several other human coronaviruses. As a practical matter, how likely are false positives? And can we expect serum antibody tests to become much more specific and reliable in the near future? Um, um, I, I think uh, false positives and false negatives are always uh, um, a possibility in any test. Um, 
there are uh, but the percentage of the false positives or negatives are released by the company or by the uh, institute that um, de devices uh, these tests and so i don't uh, it might it might be difficult for uh, for a company to say that they are 100% uh, positive or 100% specific so cross reaction is always a possibility um, so uh, can we expect serum antibody tests to become more specific and reliable? Um, um, of course, there's always there there's always um, improvements that can be done, but there's only there's a limit to what the uh, how reliable the tests are. So uh, here is has there been a case of a person getting sick again from COVID nineteen? Uh, again, I've just heard anecdotal reports. I there isn't a study regarding that. Okay. Well, I think that is our last comment and question. I want to thank you again, Dr. Singh, for your time and all of your research and work on this. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for having attended this evening. Um, our next virtual STEM Cafe is May 13th at 6 p.m. Eating in the 21st Century. Please share the word. It'll be at 6 o'clock. Also save the date for STEM Fest, October 31st, 2020. And uh, we would really like to get your feedback. So if you would please uh, send any feedback to me at jdymond at niu.edu. I would appreciate it. And I will share that with Dr. Singh. And uh, thank you to Aline Click, NIU Director of Web Media and E-Learning, and her staff, Raz Adol Sarani. Adol, uh, I'm sorry, Adul Sarani. Sorry about that, Raz. Find uh, today's uh, recording for the STEM Cafe in approximately a week. And again, we will need to make that accessible to all, so we need to work on the closed captioning. Also, thank you to those on the front lines. We are so appreciative, and we will behave ourselves and stay home. Um, uh, again, I want to repeat that the restaurants, our partner restaurants, are working together with us. And uh, Fatty's uh, Pub and Grill is offering 10% discount for anybody who attended. Uh, this evening, uh, our virtual cafes, and also in Sugar Grove, the Open Range uh, Southwest Grill is offering $5 off to anyone who says that they attended this evening. Thank you for joining us, um, and uh, we hope to, that you attend uh, future cafes. Again, we're having that one in May, and we will soon uh, be making decisions about what we're doing in uh, June. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, good evening. Thank you.